Welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. We get a chance to finish up our Star District Championships over on Lake St. Clair. We picked up some video footage of the winners who won at Crescent Sail Yacht Club on Sunday. If you're not familiar, our last show was a little bit about the Star Boats, and we talked to Mark Struby and, and we kind of gave you an insight of what Star Sailing is about. And the District Championships were just completed. So we talked to the winners that will be headed to Marblehead. And we all had a chance to check in with maybe one of the best star sailors ever. In fact, he was quoted in 1988 of saying his best victory as a sailor was winning the world championships in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And that was Paul Kerr, who's the director for the Olympic program for U.S. Sailing and the IOC. So Paul talked to us a little bit about the star boat, uh, a boat he has also over in Gull Lake, uh, a wooden boat that uh, is one of the original boats ever built. And then we get a chance to talk about his Olympic dreams as he's trying to bring back America We'll be back on that, low, uh, that global landscape to give us uh, a little more heads up. And was, Paul talked a little bit about stumbling a little bit, and he wants to be able to bring the program back. So it's a very interesting conversation with him. We're also going to check in with Chris Clark, who is the chairman for the Bayviews Port here in the Mackinac race. Talk a little bit about what's coming up this weekend and uh, just some, some other sort of last minute details. And we also touch base with the Port Huron Yacht Club Commodore, uh, Rick. Shinsky and Rick's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what to expect on Friday and uh, kind of the job of being the Commodore of a club that is sort of hosting the race, but not necessarily sponsoring it, which is kind of an, a fun conversation every year that we get a chance to have with those guys. So that'll be uh, part of the show that's coming up. Paul will be coming up in a couple of seconds and uh, we'll be right back. We're talking with one of the renowned sailors in American history, Paul K.R. Paul, I want to start in kind of a strange place. You've been quoted as saying that your biggest victory was the 1988 World Championship on a star. I asked the question if, if that's pretty accurate because we're finishing up a second show about stars. Uh, the Stars District Championship was here in Michigan and a bunch of guys were in town. And then the follow up to that is you still have one of the original stars in Gull Lake, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe you can start with your, your love of stars. Yeah, I started sailing stars when I was 17 years old. And um, at the time, the, the who's who of sailing uh, were racing stars, Lowell North, Buddy Melgis, Dennis Connor, Tom Blackaller, you know, in my world in the United States of America, that was the who's who of sailing. And uh, I crew, I started as a crew. Tom Blackaller asked me to crew for him when I was 18 years old, went to the North American Championships in Toronto and you know, every race, every mark rounding was just a huge learning experience. It was a great opportunity. And so I stuck with the star. I migrated to becoming the skipper. And um, yeah, I won the world championship in 1988. Um, eventually went to the Olympics in 04, got fifth. And it's just, uh, it's, it's in my DNA to sail the star. And I always will. So I've been sailing it for over 40 years. And my son now sails and we do. We bought Derwood Knoll's uh, boat from the gold medal boat from 64 Olympics, which is a wooden boat built by Skip Etchells in Connecticut. Uh, four, seven, eight, nine is the sail number. And there's about 30 wooden boats that are in the Gull Lake area. And we race once or twice a year. And uh, it's a lot of fun. They were, so, all at they were all at Crescent this past weekend and they were extolling the virtues of, of the boat. And of course, the discussion over beer was whether fiberglass was faster than wood and it kind of digressed into the more beers they drank, the, you know, the how that goes. Yeah. Um, why the star? It's an unusual boat because of the way it's designed. Obviously you don't need spinnakers. Is it just the look of the boat? Is it just something that you kind of migrated to? 
Yeah, I mean, if you look at today's, but it's not fast. It's not extremely exciting to sail. It's actually very hard to sail well. You have to physically hike hard, and you know, guy, kids on 49ers are laying on the trapeze and going fast. So, but in, I think it's uh, certainly in my day, it was you know, 100 boats on the starting line at the World Championships. All the boats going more or less the same speed, so the sailors really made the difference. And then the little bit of advantages you could get usually came from your tuning of the rig, which is a bit complex, but at the same time, it's an amazing rig. I mean, the star boat is one of the only boats that goes through from five knots to 25 or 30 knots of wind with one main and one jib and doesn't reef. So, you know, it's an amazing self depowering mass setup. And uh, but understanding the nuances of the rig is what makes a difference. Uh, the what the half a percent of speed you're looking for in the picture behind me, I guess it's over here. This guy looks like your partner here looks like he's got something around his feet to hold him from falling in the water. Now, I'm told that that's not a kosher deal, or is that a kosher deal? Can you have a yeah, no, no, it's absolutely kosher? So the hiking straps around his feet have been there since uh early 70s. Okay. In the old, old days, you've probably seen pictures of guys, you know, just laying on the side of the boat right. uh, in the 60s and 50s and 40s. So we, when I first started crewing, all you had was the hiking straps and you had to really hold yourself out there. And that's what allowed, I was a 210 pound kid crewing for Black Holler, but not many of the 250 year old, 250 pound guys could hike out, right? And get back in the boat and tack. So right. it's sort of self-limiting weight rule, let's say. Then in 82, we got the right to have a, a vest on and clip the vest onto the side of the boat. And that's when we blossomed into the 300 pound cruise. Okay. All right. That, that makes sense. Because the joke, the, the sort of the thread going through this is that I'm an old, big, solid quarterback. Mark Struby and I are about the same size. Mark was on last week's show. And I'm not sure with that age anymore if I had the core strength to pull myself up into the boat. So when I see guys doing that, I have great admiration for what they do. Yeah. Is it is it fair to say that Tom was Tom Blackaller was is your mentor and the fact that he was a, a two-time world champion in, in stars probably got you started in, in, in the boat? Yeah, that's absolutely fair to say, Greg. Uh he was from my yacht club, from San Francisco Bay. He was the iconic figure. Even when I was 15, he ran clinics for us, you know, in the laser when we were sailing lasers. So I had a huge awareness of Tom and he was a one time world champion in those days when I was sailing the laser and crewing for him. Then he won one more world championship in 1980 in Rio. Um, and then I did the America's Cup with him twice. You sailed all over the world. Is growing up in San Francisco and being on San Francisco Bay, does it give you advantage of a step up is there something about that body of water that that, that makes uh is there something about it that maybe the educational process comes faster yeah well it's what it is is that you grow up sailing in very strong winds and no matter whether it was a star or a big boat or a laser or whatever boat it was um, I feel that people grow who grow up on San Francisco Bay are much more comfortable in 20 plus knots of wind and therefore still racing when the conditions get that way, where 80% of the fleet is kind of in a survival mode, much more of a defensive mode, and they're not actually racing. So it gets, I've always found it gets real easy to do well in the windy races, um, like in world championships because of growing up on San Francisco Bay. Seven world championships, two Olympics, and then seven times in the America's Cup. The resume speaks for itself. Um, what I want to ask you, you speak three languages. You've had a lot of time in the corporate world, your movement. And I kind of want to ask you a couple of questions about the Olympic process. As you get in that middle 60 range is moving into the business of Olympics because of your background in sailing and, and all of your business background. Is it, is that an easier transition than maybe it would have been for somebody without the business background? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair supposition. I, I I just think that taking on this job as the executive director of the U.S. Olympic Sailing at my age, uh, 62 last year when I took the job, I'm emotionally committed to doing it through the L.A. Olympics in 28, at which point I'll be 69. 
you know, I think I'm still not too old, uh, but yet I have a lot of experience, which, you know, a younger person doesn't have. So hopefully I'm in a unique position at this stage of my career to contribute to the Olympic movement. And, you know, I was part of the 84 team as an alternate. And, um, you know, I remember the days when we were recruited to sail foreigners boats. And now, you know, you have the America's Cup boats being skippered by Australians or Kiwis, you know. So not only have we kind of lost our way in the Olympic realm, but commensurately, we've lost our way in our uh, presence in the international yachting scene. So I see this job for me is um, trying to really re return and, and turn around uh, a movement within the United States to, to get to the top echelons of our sport. Briefly, why have we lost our, our way? You know, what, what road did we take? And, and, and what's the mission for you? What do you see as a sort of a mission statement to get us back to uh, sort of, you know, equal to on par with maybe some of the guys down under? Well, I'll start with the mission. The mission is clear. What we want to attain is uh, Olympic uh, dominance, podium finishes in all the Olympic classes year in and year out. We're not measured by one year or one Olympic Games. Um, we need sustainable performance because if you have sustained performance, then what that means is you've developed a machine, a pipeline of talent, a machine to train that talent, to support that talent, because year in and year out, you're on the podium, right? Let's look at Great Britain. That's, that's where they're at. So that's the mission is to build that machine and year in and year out, compete for the podium in the Olympic class sailboats. The, we lost our way because the Brits realized that they need to build that machine 25 years ago. And we in the United States were the beneficiaries of a lot of great talent. And when the game wasn't quite so professional, when it was what I call bring your own, you know, we had no coaches, we just right. all showed up and, you know, you'd go to the star trials, there'd be 40 boats. And it was, you know, Bill Buchan and Vince Brune and Mark Reynolds and Paul Kayard and Ed Adams. I mean, pretty damn good sailors. And we were all recruited all over the world to sail, but we just had that talent. And when the rest of the world was also sort of playing in this unorganized, not so much coached realm, United States of America dominated. But when the rest of the world got some funding and said, hey, let's get organized about this and let's build a farm team and let's build a system and we'll have, you know, 200 coaches working on this and that. We didn't do that because we were resting on our laurels and we got passed. So now we're in the catch up game and in all sports, you know, the world has gotten more professional. So it's not really shocking. There's actually nothing magical about what we're trying to do. It's all kind of out there and known stuff, but we just need to do it. You know, we actually have to bring the pieces together and that's what I'm doing. I'm a little involved in the U.S. Olympic um, pipeline for ski racing and have been for a lot of years. Money is always the contingent that you have to have. If you don't have it, it's training, it's travel, it's all those things that go with it. Would it be helpful? I know this is an obvious question, but would it be helpful for the government to get involved in some of that funding? And then what appropriate number do you think would might work to, to help sailing and skiing you know, and, and sports that we don't typically see except every four years on, uh, on ABC or NBC? So skiing got their act together about 20 years ago. They have a $30 million a year budget. They have a big uh, following of private supporters because they have a World Cup event every year in the country, usually in Beaver Creek, they get you know TV revenue. So they have a commercial side that works pretty good. So they're able to, um, and I studied a lot of ski and snowboard. Um, Tiger Shaw, who was the CEO of Ski and Snowboard was on my a research project that I did with McKinsey before I took the job. Okay. So we've gone to school on ski and snowboard. And again, they started 20 years ago getting their machine going. So in some ways, we're following that machine. Um, our budget this year is $6 million. Historically, it's been about four. I was able to raise enough money to make it six. My goal is to raise it a million every year through 2026, at which point we'll be running on $10 million a year. I think on $10 million a year, we can do a good job. Great Britain 
spends a little bit more like 15 million a year. So obviously when we were on four, they were almost spending four times what we're spending. When we get up to 10, I think we can beat and compete with Great Britain. Uh, would it be helpful for the US government to be involved? Well, probably, of course it would be. But I think the way, I don't know that that's gonna happen. And in a subtle way, you can say that the US government is helpful because they do allow us to raise money through 501c3, you know, tax, uh, non, not for profit organizations. So people who do donate to us get a tax write off. So you could consider that governmental support. Um, nothing like the British system. The British government decided that the lotto, their lottery system, would give 500 million pounds a year to UK sport. So UK wow. sport is the equivalent of the US Olympic Committee. And so that 500 million pounds gets doled out across, you know, swimming and track and field and sailing and rowing and, you know, all the Olympic sports. But that's what the British government decided to do. I'm not waiting around for the U.S. government to do that. But we have a blessing in the United States of America. We have a concept called an endowment. And it's a very well understood concept in America. You know, these universities like Yale and Harvard and Stanford have $30 billion endowments. So how is it possible that the U.S. Olympic Committee doesn't have a $200 million or a $1 billion endowment? But they don't. They don't. They haven't done that. So what part of my sustainability program so that I can walk away from this thing in 2029 is I'm building a $100 million endowment for the U.S. Sailing Club. And Ding Schoonmaker, whom I'm sure you know, a great star sailor I was able to meet with, he passed, unfortunately, but I'm, and he loved Project Pinnacle, which is this project that what we're doing. And he committed in his estate seven and a half million to the endowment. And the, the, the last two and a half is a match. So trying to create the first $10 million brick, let's say of the 100 million. Right. And so we're really fortunate with that. But that's the, you know, professional, you can't just go around begging for money forever. Right. Because people say, well, when is this going to end? So I'm trying to build a better, smarter, an actual revenue model. Like what's the revenue plan here? Revenue plan is to grow commercial sponsorship from the one and a quarter million we have now to 3 million. It's to bring in four if we have $100 million in endowment, we should be able to count on $4 million a year of you know, kickoff from the endowment, right? Without invading the principal. And so there's then now we have seven of the 10. And you know, maybe we still ask and get donors, but more for like two or three million, not not the full six million the way we are now. So these are the kind of big picture items, Greg, that I'm trying to resolve these are the glaring things that to me are missing and why we got passed. One of the spokes in that wheel of, of success has certainly got to be membership. U.S. sailing junior numbers are, are slipping a little bit. It's not growing at the exponential rate that some of, of other sports are growing. Although if you look at most of the numbers in, in the Federation, which is the high school numbers that you grow, most all sports are down. Kids aren't coming back as fast as we thought they were. But one of the spokes in that cog is obviously having more kids sailing. With foiling becoming a, certainly a visible aspect at the top of that mark, where do you see the how do you how do you attract more young guys to come back and to get them, young guys and ladies to get back into boats? Well, getting them in for sure, foiling is the thing. And it, by the way, fifty percent of the Olympic disciplines foil now. Yeah. So. Um, one, we think that the, it seems that the easiest entree to the foiling is the winging, you know, and in fact, you can teach a kid to foil towing them behind a motorboat at first, just to get the foiling down, or you'll see the kids, sometimes they can just pump the foil and foil, right? Right. So we're going to start actually already our West Marine U.S. Open in San Francisco, adding wing foiling to our mix of Olympic class sailing that we do with the West Marine U.S. Opens. And we are putting a big emphasis into uh, creating an entree to foiling. It's fun, it's fast, and it's in our wheelhouse because, again, 50% of the boats foil. So we have our antenna up on that. The other side, Greg, is that, for example, 
you might know that the USA, uh, we just got second in the Opti Worlds and we won the team world, the team part of it, the team championship. Okay. So thanks to the parents, a large portion of them are in Southern Florida, but they're all over the country and a very well-structured Opti program nationally, we continually pump out good Opti sailors. So we need to do a great job of taking the 15 year olds and helping them get in the 29er and helping them get into the youth world boats and then on into the um, Olympic boats. So creating that pathway. And, and as we become more successful, you know, there's gonna be Ben Ainsley's and Shirley Robertson's idols for the kids to aspire to. So when it comes to that difficult moment, am I going to college or am I gonna put three years in and go get an Olympic medal? you know, and dealing with the parents and the anxiety and what do you mean you're going to go sailing? And so retention, which is what you're talking about, cultivation and retention is a big um, nut that I'm trying to crack. And there's a few important pieces to it. So uh, we're working on that pathway to make it in, uh, the incentive for the kids to really dedicate themselves. Being a non-racer, I ran our junior sailing program for two or three years because I was a college coach. They needed a coach to run it. But my point was, is there was not a lot of inside baseball and my point, sandlot stuff. So you'd watch the kids reopen up the weekends, just have the kids just use the boats because that junior sailing programs, it was always somebody directing them. There was never any extemporaneous enjoyment of just going out and being in the boat. And as you talk to people in, in our age group, you know, oh, you talk to Gary Jobson, he went from Benedict Bay and they would go 12 miles to go to a restaurant and have something and sail back. You know, as long as they had their life jackets on. And there's not a lot of sandlot sailing. It always seems to be so organized. And then how do you get a kid to have more fun? And I'll use the other model is that U.S. Sailing 10 years ago recognized that they went from 70 percent structured practice and 30 percent free skiing and, and switched it. It's now 30 percent hardcore technical practice and 70 percent working on something that might that they have worked on a technical part in a, in a free in a free base. And it's a lot more fun when you're doing those kinds of things. Because at the end of that rope, ski scholarships and certainly sailing scholarships are not like it is in football or, or basketball. It's not the same. It's not the same model. So is part of that mission also making fun part of that uh, formula? You know, I think you're absolutely right. And maybe I'm take I'm going to take that on board a little more. I think, you know, I'm focused on a pretty, you know, narrow tip of the spear, you might say, in this competitive realm. But. Uh, you know, it's not in my wheelhouse, but I, I do like and appreciate the Siebel Sailors program that we have because it's community sailing, it's broad based, it's outreach. Um, there's a lot of DEI in it, of course, and it's just opportunity. And I think there there's much more the exploration, adventure. I just want to go for a sail. I want to see if I can sail across the lake and back. Um, which builds a lot of self-confidence, by the way. You know, the, the minute you untie the boat from the dock and you're on your own in the little boat, like I did when I was eight years old, I mean, you're building a lot of great traits as a human, self-confidence and self-reliance. And so anyway, I hear you and I think you're on. That's important. And we just need to make sure, even if we're concentrating on world championships and Olympic medals, somewhere in the pyramid we need to make sure that we're exposing people to the sport as a lifetime it's it's a lifestyle sailing's a lifestyle you know the racing part of sailing is about this big to be honest with you right the real big part of sailing is the lifestyle part you know going to tortola and renting a moorings boat with your family and cruising around and swimming and doing all i mean that's really how you enjoy sailing 25 years ago, a bunch of us had kids that were coming up in the ski world. We had 400 feet of, of landfill and we'd go out to Vail or we'd go out to the mountains and we'd get killed halfway down the hill because we didn't have, we didn't ski in altitude and we certainly didn't ski in numbers. of. So we just started to figure out the replication that how many vertical feet do they ski in a week? We had to figure out how to do that same number of, 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 of vertical footage by just doing it more. So we had 50 runs up the hill in a day when they had three and it turns out it was the same vertical and Eventually, as we built numbers and made it fun, you know, we had the Michaela Schifrins and, and Lindsey Vaughns and some of those guys. And those guys all came through camps in Minnesota at, at Buck Hill. So 
some of the two of the best racers that ever, you know, hit a ski hill. So you can, if, if you have the numbers, you, you find the championships. If that makes any sense. Well, creating numbers is a big part. You know, one of my fundamental things is we're not bringing the power of a population of 330 million people to bear on the sport of sailing. Right. We don't do a good job. I mean, we bring 330 million people to bear on the sport of basketball and baseball and football to a lesser extent, soccer, golf, tennis, but sailing is not exposed enough. So again, that's why I like the Siebel Sailor Program. And we're going to, we're talking about possibly if we can raise the money to do adding uh, winging right now, the Siebel Sailor Program uses those RS Fivas and RS Quest boats, you know, they're nice boats. And, but if we could add some winging there, maybe some young kids would like to explore the foiling side. And last question in, in relationship to the growth of the sport, the lands, the ethnic landscape has to get wider. I, I think, I don't think there's any doubt about that, which means you have to give kids more opportunity. There's a lot of clubs that don't have foils because it's an expensive sport. You might, you buy a couple of four twenties at seven or 8,000 bucks a year. So money is a hindrance at the moment for clubs that has to over. How do you overcome that? If you're the Commodore at a particular club, you, stay on the same old path or do you, you, you maybe chart a new one and, and, and think about something that is out there in the future? Because the guys at Sail GP, we were in Chicago a couple weeks ago and they're convinced that that's the direction. And they're certainly putting a lot of money into making that pathway successful. Sail GP is convinced? You're saying Sail GP is convinced? They're convinced that the, the younger guys are going to come to foiling or faster they're going to come back to, to traditional sailing. Right. And I talked to Spithill about all that. I'm a little bit in the know. I guess they got a couple of clubs to buy the Melgis. Um, I'm not sure the name of the boat. It's a Melgis foiling. Yeah. And they're working with them and those clubs and, you know, giving them uh, instructors. And yeah, I think so. And, you know, that's the other side of the winging. The winging, I think, is the least expensive of the foiling boats, certainly less than a wasp or certainly way less than a moth. Um, even the kite foil or the IQ foil, those are all around seven grand. So I think you can get into winging because it's just a little thing you hold in your hand for maybe around 3000, but yeah, sailing's an expensive sport. And, um, you know, we'd like to help. I think I do know that the manufacturers are willing to give some pretty big discounts here and help support the movement in the United States. We're a little behind some countries like France, maybe even the UK, believe it or not in the whole foiling realm so it's on our it's on our radar and um we we're, we want to work with the clubs and and you know the trend is foiling so right. it 420s and lasers have been there uh we've been doing that for 50 years but now uh there's a new trend coming along and it's basically fast is fun that's the motto fast is fun so that's how to get more numbers involved in our sport Oh, you pulled on the colors as a, an athlete. Now you pull on the colors as an administrator. Is it the same feeling? It's always more fun to race, but uh, but I, you know, all through my career, people say, "Do you wish you were still racing in the America's Cup, or do you, you know, I went around the world twice. Do you wish you were still going around the world?" And I, I, some reason, I've never had that. I don't regret anything. I don't wish I was somewhere where I'm not. I'm very. I guess I'm just present. I'm ha I love the fact that I have the opportunity to, to participate in this uh, way now. I think it's a very needed role. Um, and I'm, I'm not doing it for the compensation, I can tell you that. So <laughs> I, I think it'd be a very satisfying achievement if we can turn this uh, ship around and create that machine that year in and year out you know, produces a depth of talent in our sport that makes us all proud. Well, as a skipper, you have to be single-minded. I'm guessing in this job, you have to be really single-minded because everybody has an opinion, but few have your resources, both educationally and certainly, you know, competitively. So I got to think they got the right guy in the right job at the moment. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, obviously time will tell and legacy will take care of itself. But I would seem to me at, at this age, it's got to be really rewarding to know that, you know, the future is going to be better than maybe what it has been the last 10 years, just because of the way things kind of have stumbled a little bit. Yeah, I think so, Greg. And I'm getting some nice positive feedback from the people who are paying attention. So, uh, 
but it's it's a long steep hill to climb and we're just uh you know maybe one eighth of the way up the hill so we got a ways to go one of our guys and i have two, two last questions uh one of our guys wanted me to ask you you got you're the first american to win the round the world in the whip bread. and he wanted to know very specifically he does one hand he does um one man sailing on this single-handed uh, society here in the great lakes and they're about to embark i think seven times around lake erie or something what is it on those kind of races that to keep your sanity what is it and you have any tricks to, to to be on board that it got to be more than reading books oh there's no time to read books you know we it's full on and um i just was blessed with the groups that we had that we put together and obviously a lot of i mean we had great chemistry so it carried us through the rough times even when you win you have your tough times um and so you build you have the a little bit of chemistry before you leave the dock but as you can imagine being at sea for three weeks stuck in a shoe box you know you're either building good chemistry or or you're not so we just had a great group of guys and somehow were able to keep everything uh positive and it was a huge strength and and i enjoy that you know i look back to my high school days playing football and basketball in high school and a lot of the things I learned in high school football and basketball, I have used in my teams in Salem. Our interview with Gary Jobson was cool because you said he was at 15 or 16, a world champion, but he had to sit on the bench as a basketball player. And he had to learn the humble part of being sitting on the bench, then going out in the summer and sailing with the basketball coach's daughter and being a, a sort of a national level champion where he couldn't hardly dribble a basketball back at Benicate Bay. So he said he learned a very, very good lesson. My last question. It's one I haven't asked very often, but I want to ask it of you. Why do you think you're a good sailor? Or what makes you a good sailor? I think uh, sailing has a massive amount of variables. And um, my mind just allows me to track the variables and, um, and establish the relevance of those variables to the big picture. Um, usually uh, in a, in a, in the right way. So I've thought about that a lot lately and I see it in other things in, in life. And that's what it is. It's that I, a lot of people you'll see will miss a little thing here or there. Maybe it's just, you know, pumping the bicycle tire up with air and they forget the cap or, you know, I am a meticulous person and it allows me to track many variables. And as you know, our sport has, it's a very complex sport. So I think it's that, and I'm a numbers guy. I'm very good with numbers. So um, those kind of, my mind just works that way. Is it trained or is it hereditary? Heredity. I, I think a lot of things actually we're born with. I don't, those, that quality anyway, I'm sure I inherited. Mom or dad? I actually think my mom. Okay. I just, I got to jump. Lost. I, I was jump. looking. Yeah, no, that's I, I appreciate that. Did mom and dad sail? Both of them? They got into it after. I got into sailing totally by accident. Uh, none of us sailed, but a kid in my second grade class, his parents dabbled in sailing. So they invited me once or twice to a lake in Oakland, Lake Merritt, and we borrowed some boats. And my dad could see I liked it. So he built me a boat in our garage when I was eight. And we went from there and then they having to drive me everywhere and, you know, be around, they decided, well, maybe we better get a boat. So then my parents got into it. They got a snipe and uh, used to race and hold divorce court every Sunday night at the dinner table. <laughs> well, I appreciate the insight and uh, sharing the stories and, and I appreciate your time very much. Thanks, Thank Greg. You. you know, president of our class, the Governor Tom Londrigan yeah. and T.C. Belko. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. All right. And in first place, a repeat of last year's Blue Star is Arthur Anisoff and Dave Caesar.
Ooh, we got the speaker here. <laughs> right, well, I want to thank you very much. It's always a pleasure coming to this club. Fabulous place. And the lake both delivered and didn't deliver its reputation this week because it was crazy and that's its reputation. So right. it's wonderful. Thanks to everybody you thank. Thanks to the race committee and the club. It's wonderful. But especially thank you to you, Terry. Well, In your manic kind of way, you pulled this whole thing together. <laughs> And it was amazing. So thank you very much for all your efforts. Yeah. I know it was huge. So well, thank you. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much so to our, thanks very much to our host Rob and developing a new appreciation for non-such sailboats. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. We'll get you there one of these days. So well, yeah, we, we look, get, look forward to coming back. Okay, so we gotta get this pick. You guys gotta hold that again. I'm staying in this pick. Logan, We're talking with Chris Clark, the 2022 Bayview Pork here in the Mackinac Race Chairman. Chris, we just want to check in six, four days ahead of time uh, before the race on Saturday. You get the fr a big night coming up on Friday. I know your phone's ringing like crazy, but uh, talk briefly about three things. Let's start with how many boats do you have this year? About 190. Does that sound about right? Uh, that's a little, uh, sorry, winds blow the monitor around the computer around a little bit. I'll uh, hold it down. Uh, we have, uh, we're really about 175 boats right now. Okay. So we haven't we've got a few boats. We've had a few, few boats drop out uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, our largest boat dropped out uh, the Andrews 80. We had a 52 drop out today. Uh, you know, the 52 got struck by lightning. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, there's, there's always a little attrition there at the end. What 52 got hit by lightning? Nimbus. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's out of Ohio. Okay. All right. Um, we talked briefly earlier about, you know, sort of the, the new, new normal as compared to what it was in 19, maybe explain a little bit about that because it's, it's almost normal, but it isn't quite normal. You have the, you have the sail, you have the cold, you have the uh, short and, um, just kind of walk through the two different races. Yeah, we have the uh, short course, you know, which is uh, both races start in Port Huron. I think everybody knows that. And then we sail up and around the uh, one, the short course sails up and around the Michigan shoreline. And then you go north of Boys Blank Island and finish in Mackinac. And then the Cove Island course goes out to a mark, uh, used to be a, a mark that the Canadian government set, but now it's a virtual mark this year. And uh, it's set off Tobamori, Canada. And then it's an in, almost always historically, an into the wind leg from there, about 120 miles to the finish in Mackinac. Okay. So for anybody who likes a good upwind race, that, that, that's a good course for you. Let's hope the, the, the wind is blowing in the right direction. The other issue that you got, that I think, is, a, is an improvement. Obviously, you get a chance to be uh, rafting out at the uh, at the island, which helps a little bit. So everybody, yes, we do. Consolidated uh, with, uh, I mean, we've got a lot of great local support from the island, uh, plus the DNR, plus we had um, uh, Representative uh, John DeMoose, you know, came in on our side, and we were able to, uh, you know, get to put 170, 177 boats back in the harbor again. And we are really excited about that. You know, that's part of the race. The camaraderie is part of the race. And being able to raft in the harbor is part of the camaraderie. It so also we are going to be able to accommodate all boats on the island. Okay. It also changes the party facility, party place, right, as well? Uh, yes. We're going to be, uh, the party this year is going to be at Mission Point Hotel, or Mission Point Resort. I should say that correctly. Uh, Mission Point is uh, absolutely spectacular. The amount of work they've done there is unbelievable. And it, it, the resort is spectacular. It is gorgeous. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. U.S. Sailing is getting the certificates out. That's probably the, the biggest headache up to next up Friday. Is that fair? Uh, yep. Yep. They're grinding away at them. And hopefully we'll, uh, hopefully we'll have all of them that we need uh, uh, in the next couple of days. How many do you uh, need? Left? How many are left? Uh, I think they're about uh, the last report I saw were 25 or 26 certificates still needed to be still needed to be issued. Yeah. So it's not that it's not a huge thing, right? Well, but out of 170 some odd boats, uh, you know, that's not a, not an insignificant percentage. Yeah, that's true. Um, I just got to touch on this one. You sent out, you've sent all kinds of reports out. So everybody knows to keep up, if they follow your, uh, your cues from your communications, I think there've been 16 or 17 of those since uh, maybe March. Uh, 20 now. 20. 
one of them was kind of interesting and, and explain what Corinthian is and, and to, to those who don't know and, and, and what what kind of that was about. You, you want guys well, to be honest. Uh, well, Corinthian, uh, you know, this sport, this is a sport that's founded on uh, you follow the rules, you know, and it's self-policing. So, you know, and our, our sport is built to be self-policing. That's what a protest is. You think somebody else has done something wrong? Well, then you protest them and you, you know, go to a hearing and you work out and decide which one's right, which one's wrong. Uh, you know, but Corinthian is uh, so much now. Uh, I actually heard a comment that somebody made one time. Well, why do we have juries and umpires uh, if they're not there to catch us? And, you know, that's not why I joined this. That, that's not why I started out in this sport. I started out in this sport because the onus is on the individual competitor. And, uh, you know, I think most of the people know that I sailed on uh, Bill Alcott's equations for decades. And uh, there's actually a shirt that we have. And the title of the shirt is Integrity. And it's doing the right thing even when nobody else is watching. Right. And it's uh, from many years ago when, the, when one of the marks was out of position. And uh, we searched for many, 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 many hours to find the mark. And, uh, you know, uh, Corinthian, it's not just a word. It's a way of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a way of life. And it's a way of just, you know, honor your commitments. So, uh, you know, and uh, we need people to honor their commitments. And we're getting a lot of the certificates corrected. We're getting a lot of the measurements corrected. And uh, with the new measurement system that we're using, which is uh, ORC as opposed to ORR that we've used uh, two years ago, we started going to ORC. And one of the benefits about ORC is all the data is, is visible to all other competitors. And uh, this makes it, you know, easy for people to ask questions about other boats. Yeah. I'm assuming that what you're cleaning up and kind of getting things squared up has got to certainly help the Chicago to Mac race. Uh, yeah, you know, there, there's some overlap, uh, but yeah, you know, both, both sides have their, have their issues. Yeah. Um, you have a race within a race this year. Yes, we do. Kind of, uh, we're, go ahead. We're talk, I'm sorry. No, talk through that because my question is, is it really a race within a race or is it another opportunity to, uh, provide advertising? Oh no. <laughs> well, this goes back to being like the Sydney Hobart bat was back when I was a kid. Okay. Uh, you know, they had a race within the race. Uh, Rolex sponsored, uh, the, you know, a boat full of Rolexes for the first boat out of the heads. And this is our, you know, this is our version of that with a, a local, you know, I mean, this is a Detroit race. Let's face it. This is Detroit. You know, this is, uh, this is Michigan. This is Lake Huron. And we've got a great, you know, Detroit business that's, uh, that's working with us. And they're providing trophies for this for this race, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's another opportunity, uh, you, know, you know. It's an opportunity for a sponsor to participate. It's an opportunity for other people to, uh, you know, to win a prize. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. It's not just a, you know, it's not just about a sponsorship opportunity. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, we can we can do those a lot easier than a lot easier than this. I mean, you know, they've got their own tracker page. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the the excitement about the first boat out of the heads in the Sydney Hobart race. I mean, that was a huge deal. Okay. Um, so, we it, should, you know, it harkens back to that. And, and yeah. We should point out that it's the 45th parallel to race to the 45th. Which yes. If you're not familiar, it's about where Gaylord is. If you could imagine drawing a, a horizontal line across into the lake. And the company... Well, everybody that's... says, where does Up North start? Well, Up North starts above the 45th. Right. Well, there's some folks that would agree that it's up north is anything north of Saginaw, but that's that's, a, that's for another debate. The yeah. the company sponsoring it is a local watch company as well. Correct. Yep. Uh, Shinola, Shinola Shinola is the sponsor of that. And there but we have. A, I mean, we've got a lot of other fantastic sponsors. Um, and yeah, you know, I guess I would encourage. You know, I'm going to mess it up if I go through and I start listing them out here. But they're all listed on the website. Uh, you know, DraftKings. Uh, you know, we've got, a uh, we've got beer sponsors. We've got, I'm, I, I apologize. I, yeah, I messed this all oh, up. I'm we'll, sorry. And we'll list, we'll list them as we go through. Last couple of questions. Okay. I told you I wasn't going to keep you long. Um, your original yacht scoring 
genius is no longer with yes. us. And yes. you have a tribute to him both on a shirt and as well as the picture up on the website. And, and just yes, talk we to do. that briefly. Uh, well, um, the, you know, I, I did this race. I was chairman in 2020 and I came back to be chairman uh, this year uh, because a good friend, a uh, good friend of mine, good friend of the sports, a uh, good friend of everybody, Louis Call suddenly passed away. Yeah. Uh, you know, Louis and I sailed thousands of miles together and probably drank near as many bottles of wine together. Uh, you know, just a kind-hearted person. But Louis was the owner of Yacht Scoring. Uh, he was also wrote the custom software that we use to run the race on. And uh, yeah, we've got some, if you look around, you're going to see a few little tributes to, uh, to Louis. If you look around, you'll see an L and a Z flag are on our shirts. Uh, yeah, we, we miss Louie a lot. You're racing this year on? Dynamis. Okay, like you always do. Uh, no, uh, prior to that, uh, for many, many, many years, I raced on uh, uh, Equation, Bill Alcott's Equation. Okay. Uh, yeah, for decades. And then I uh, did a couple of races on uh, the Ohana, which is what uh, uh, Tor Huff and the Huff family purchased Equation and have renamed it Ohana. And uh, this year I'm sailing on Dynamis. As chairman, this is my last question. When do you get to take a deep breath? When the gun goes off, when you're out in the lake, is that the only time you can take a deep breath at that point? Or is it, do you get to the bar? Uh, no, 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 no. It's going to be when, uh, it's going to be when they start the race, because then I've got a job to do. When we start the race, I've got a job to do, and uh, I want to do that well. And then when I walk off the boat after the race, I'll put my race chairman's hat back on again. Chris, I appreciate your time. We're lucky enough to spend a couple of minutes this morning with uh, Rick Shinsky. It's uh, Tuesday during the Mac week and the Port Huron Yacht Club is the uh, host of a race that's sponsored by Bayview Yacht Club, which is obviously the annual Port Huron to Mackinac race. So Rick, thanks for joining us. And I just want to, how are, how are things going at this moment and what, what becomes a big job for you as Commodore? Well, I say we're, we're in the calm before the storm right now, Greg, it's, um, Things really start happening tomorrow. Boats have been coming in over the week, but they really start getting here tomorrow, Thursday, Friday. Um, what we do here at the club is put on a big party, <laughs> pretty much. Yes. We host uh, we host a lot of the, the sailors and the local public come in and do that. Uh, it, really, what I do is just kind of try and oversee everything. I don't know if you know that our club is all member run. Right. Yeah. Commodore, vice commodore, rear commodore, and then we have a number of committees that execute all the um, duties thereof, you know. And uh, Tyson Connolly, our vice commodore, is in charge of the party this year, so he's putting everything together. And I just, I'm here to help out and support and represent the Port Union Yacht Club and as best we can, in the light that we can. I just, uh, I just talked to Chris. Uh, who is the chairman of the, of the race. Um, yeah. And Chris, I asked Chris a question. I want to ask you the same question. When do you get to take a deep breath? Ah, Saturday, Saturday about night. Noon. Yeah. Saturday about noon. Really okay. on a family vacation after that. Um, I'm not sailing this year, uh, but we're going to go on a family vacation and that's going to be it. <laughs> okay. That's the, well, take, take the deep, deep breath. breath. Did, a lot of, um, We've been doing it a number of years, uh, and it, it is anxiety. Uh, you get a little anxious before, but things really seem to come together, and everybody pitches in, and it, and it happens. Um, again, it, the club has been in existence for almost 100 years, um, and the smack and our race has been going on for almost 100 years. They're going to celebrate theirs in two years. We celebrate ours next year. Right. They're um, I don't, I don't want to make light of that. This is not old hat. You know, we, we, there's a lot of ducks to get in a row to get things together, but it's an exciting, how do I, how, what's the best way to put that in it? Anxious, exciting time for us in, in, in sailing right now. This is, this happens every year. And taking a sample series of the entrance, it seems to me that about 80% of the guys running in this race are guys who've done it before. It's a yeah. very much of an annual thing. So that's got to help the organizational part, because if you've done it before, you have some expectation of what it is coming in, where to put a boat, how to, you know, how to raft all those little things that can be headaches for somebody who might not know. 
So that's sure. got to be a bit of a help. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say to that, Greg, right now. But, yeah, they, um, the people that come in, again, it, it, it happens. I guess the best way to say it, I, I don't want to make light of this either, but it just happens. Right. People, the, the sailing community help out each other. You know, people come in and they're there to help. And any questions that need to be answered, we're here to help them do that or pitch in wherever we need to. It, it's it's just our community. And I think that anybody that's going to watch us will, will agree with that. Yeah. No matter. There's a bit of a party now that wasn't maybe since 219. It's at Port Heron's going to throw a pretty good party Friday night. There's music back. There's food trucks back. So yeah. it's gotten to be, and we're going to run the schedule at the end of the show after we uh, get a chance to talk to Paul Kayard. And Great. part of that press process is that, it's it's hopefully attract more folks. Plus, you guys, I think if I'm not mistaken, with the map, there's been a lot of changes in the geography for the on the on the hard stuff. Uh, yes, with our tents and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Vice Commodore Tyson Conley has put together a whole new layout for Mackinac. So this will be a first time. Either I don't either it's going to work or it's not. We're going to find out. Uh, right. We're going to make it work. So usually. It's a big part. Like last year with the COVID, we, we threw this party together at the month before. And we had one of our biggest years. So I think that people are ready to get out and get going again. And with the layout, I, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I'm sure that things are going to go well. I've always been fascinated about the club itself in that you host a race, but you don't sponsor it. And that was a conversation I had with last year's yeah, Commodore yeah. John Anner, and it's just it's, it's such a workable uh, solution for for the process. You guys should be real proud of yourselves because I think it's pretty cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, and it, it's been a good arrangement with Bayview, and and it's good working with the people. I mean, and and, and it does it, it shines light on our club, and it allows again camaraderie in the sailing community, and it's a great when you're right here. You're only a mile away from the race, from the start of the race. So boats coming in, just, it works out real well. Okay. Well, John, I appreciate you spending the time. I know it's, you're, it's you're, how busy you are. I just wanted to put a cap on uh, a little bit before the show. We're talking with uh, Jay Austin, who's a uh, friend of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. Jay is down at the Vermilion Boat Club. And uh, Jay, you're going to let us talk to a couple of young ladies in a three-handed Thistle race, which is also qualifier for Makatawa, coming up in uh, in a relatively short period of time. You're the PRO today for the race. Um, so tell me a little bit about the race and maybe talk a little bit about the winners. Yeah, for sure. So wow, racing today was it was incredible. We had uh, we had nine teams um, that were racing um, for one spot to uh, qualify for Makatawa. Um, all around our region, you know, a couple of teams from Cleveland, uh, North Cape up in Toledo. We had some inland boats from the Hoover area, Leatherlips, uh, Columbus, and uh, really, really tight racing. Um, we had anywhere from eight to 12 knots of breeze, uh, open waters of, of Lake Erie, which was a little different than last week. Last week we were on Sandusky Bay, so it was a little more protected. Uh, but this week we had uh, open waters right off of uh, the Vermilion River and a uh, little bit of chop little bit chop uh, i can say the least and uh really good breeze um but uh very competitive conditions you know we were uh we did a lot of course changes uh we had you know kids that were finishing in first kids that were finishing in you know fourth or fifth and you know only seconds behind each other so uh really really uh um high intensity racing today and it was a lot of fun to uh to watch these kids compete jay i got a curious young this is is there an age group limit on this is this any age um, 13 to 18. Okay. Most kids don't have thistles. Is that fair? Um, yeah. So usually, um, in our area, more... we do, we race thistles, but, um, the more popular boat is the laser in the 420. So right. but my um, question, my question is, is I'm assuming that a lot of the boats are borrowed probably, right? Oh yeah. These are all borrowed boats. Yep. Okay. So these kids really got to be on top. I guess my point is these kids really got to be on top of their game. Is that I mean I you know I understand all this is the same, all lasers are the same, but every boat's not always necessarily the same. So that's that's kind of a cool thing too. Well, yeah, it's very true too. And you know, none of these kids sail thistle uh, during the summer. A lot of them are just kind of uh, borrowed boats, and they're just get, getting a crew together. So, um, especially this team that you're going to talk to, um, 
you know, these kids come from 420s mostly, 420s, right? And uh, and so they put a couple teams together and they said, hey, let's go sailing. And, you know, now they're going to be qualifiers for the national event. So it's pretty cool. Okay. Well, good. Yep. We're following up with talking with Kate Keen. And Kate is a member of the Vermilion Boat Club. So you're the local and you're also the chair for the race. So yeah. just briefly tell me what it's like to be a parent, number one, and then also still have to run the race. Because that's two hats and they're really hard to wear at the same time sometimes. <laughs> well, luckily, um, when you put the right people in the right places and they get to make the decisions that you know are just good for sailing for everybody involved, it makes it really easy as a parent. So um, I was lucky enough to be just, um, we had a lot of family out helping, a lot of friends from the area and um you know, kind of some last minute changes, but when you have the, like I said, when you have the right group around you, it makes the difference. All the world is a difference. So we had um, a lot of safety boats out there that were family. We had a lot of friends that um, volunteers for Vermilion Boat Club as well, who are um, donating their boats. Uh, Mike Mose actually, Mike Mose and Vermilion Yacht Sales has been amazing. We launched all of the thistles and the safety boats from their boat yard today. So we were kind of able to stay out of sail camp here so that Vermilion could still get their little ones out on the water as well. Vermilion is an interesting place because you got the river coming through and it really is a protected harbor, but it, it's a very unique uh, facility and play, uh, you know, ge geography wise, geographically, it's pretty cool. It's a nice, it's a nice yeah. harbor. Um, I'm assuming now you head to with your daughter, who I'm guessing we're going to talk to here briefly. Yes, she. Um, I have um, my daughter and my niece are both on the okay. boat along with a family friend who um, I just heard from my aunt as well that um, his grandparents and my grandmother. I think that somebody uh, they're sitting here next to me. I hadn't told him about this, but um, had taught I had taught school together. So. I know it's just a, it's it, the sailing community is so small but so big and so right. tight. And I, and the last question, this obviously is a family thing because you said you were on the junior program before we got started. So yeah. this has been you've been in the water in north uh, the west end of the of Lake Erie for a while. I sure have. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for helping out on the races. I'm sure the kids appreciate it, and uh, thanks for your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, getting these kids and showing what they're doing because they are. Um, this is an amazing program that we have on Lake Erie, and we're really proud to keep it going and to get these kids going until they're adults. That's the next. That's the next step. We're talking with uh, three national qualifiers for Macatawa Bay coming up uh, in a thistle, and it was a three-man race today. So I've got uh, Annika, I've got Kelly, and I've got Daniel, and uh, you guys are all from Edgewater. And you'll see underneath there. I'm not going to try to mess with the names. Your names are underneath uh, as I'm talking to you. So I guess to start with. The easiest question, who's the skipper of the group? I'm the skipper. Well, that worked out good. Um, talk about the race today. I, when you get into a boat that you've really never sailed before, I mean, you sail thistles, but it's not uh, your boat. I find that remarkable because that, that's not, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've been in a thistle. This is my third time. I've never skippered one before. So there's a little bit of a learning curve this morning. It was pretty windy, pretty wavy. So I had to like get used to playing with the main and the tiller. And it's a lot different from a laser, which I normally sail. So I just had to like find a groove and be able to like get my bow down, keep flow over the sails, not stall out. Kelly, how hard is it um, when you're in a boat that you don't necessarily know as well as you'd like? Because obviously it's borrowed. Um, what's, what's the things you worry about as, 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 as crew? Um, well, you know, the biggest thing with a borrowed boat is crashing it, <laughs> um, so we try to keep our distance, you know, we think through our maneuvers before we do them, um, and as far as, like, boat handling goes, it's just practice. We do a couple spinnaker sets uh, before the races start, and then work through our maneuvers and communicate as well as we can. Anika, what's what do you focus on when you're racing? Um, so I'm the middle, so upwind, it's just, um, trying to feed information to the skipper and, um, then downwind, I'm on the spinnaker, so just trying to keep that flying at all times, and it's sometimes difficult if I want to look back and see what everyone's doing, but <laughs> I just got to remember to stare at the kite. Good skip, on this particular boat, good skipper, you guys all communicate well, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say we did a good job. How close uh, was the race today? You guys 
for, for the most part, blow people away? Was it close? Was it a, a tight race? Um, there were us and another boat oftentimes at the top. Uh, so we were duking it out with them. What made the difference was the start day for us. We were able to get a few good clean starts. They were pushing the line a little bit. So they had an OCS to worry about. But towards the end of the day, we were consistently up at the top. And last race, we had a sizable lead okay. coming into the finish. You guys are used to Lake Erie. You're headed to Lake Michigan. Michigan's just got bigger chop, especially on that on that eastern shore with all mm -hmm. the weather coming across. Um, have you thought about that? Or is that something you guys are going to get there early in practice for? Uh, fortunately for us, we have a VX1, which will be sailing in Michigan. So you're going to have a lot of practice going into the event. And Lake Erie is oftentimes very lumpy. So hopefully it's something that we haven't seen before. Okay. Do bigger waves help in thistles or not help? Um, Downwinds are really nice because yeah. we were able to get good surf, uh, but upwind. Upwind, yeah. you don't really want any chop <laughs> in any boat. <laughs> well, and, yeah. I, and I'm thinking you guys are probably going to be on the bay anyway. You're going to probably be on Mackinac Bay, probably sailing instead of being out on Lake Michigan. That would probably make more, more sense. Yeah. Is there some carpentry going on in the back there? Somebody dropped something. That was funny. Uh, Opening and closing doors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, last question. You guys are all seniors coming into high school? This, this, this in August, September? Uh, I'll be going to college. They still have another year of high school left. <laughs> well, I have two. Oh. <laughs> I'm going into senior year, going into junior year, and okay. he's going into freshman year. Yep. Well, here's, <laughs> I just got a chance to talk for an hour with Paul Kayard, who's the Olympic manager for the U.S. sailing team. One of the conversations we had about sailing is that there's all kind of basketball and football scholarships, and sometimes parents only put their money into you know, things that they think there's some reward for. Sailing isn't exactly at the end of the rainbow, doesn't have a, a pot of gold where you can get all kinds of opportunities. So my question is, do you sail for fun and the enjoyment of it, or is it something you'd like to maybe make more of? And I say that because one of the conversations we talk, I was talking with Paul was that they're putting this monster, this program together, but you still have to have kids. You still have to have numbers. And U.S. sailing's numbers at your age are shrinking. They just are. More people look like me than look like you sailing boats because it's expensive. And so go around individually and tell me what, what it is that motivates you. And is, is there a chance of maybe sailing in college? I think that um, like what kind of motivates me to keep sailing is like just the feeling of victory. And um, just even when things are going right on the race course, it just feels really good. Um, but all things considered for the future, I would like to sail in college. Um, and that's kind of what I've been looking at when I've been researching. But um, if I don't get to, then it's too bad and I'll just find stuff in the area. But I plan on staying sailing for okay. ever. <laughs> Kelly? Kelly? Um, I'd say what motivates me to keep going through sailing is the people that I meet because there's always more people to meet and um, you can always get closer with the people like you sail with or you sail against. And um, as far as the future goes, I do want to sail in college, but uh, if, like Annika said, if it doesn't end up working out in the college that I go to, I'll do my best to get into any boat I can. True. And uh, do that throughout the season. Well, and with you, with this family thing with mom, obviously well, she's the chairman of the race, so you, you've got that sometimes pushing a little bit from behind. So it is what it is. Oh, Daniel, yeah. we had the rest of my life, whether I like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I understand that program. Daniel, were you headed to college, and did you plan on racing college at all, club team or anything like uh, that? Yeah, I'm going to Brown University up in Rhode Island, so I'm going to be with uh, Coach Mollicone. Uh I'm going to be on the club team this fall. Hopefully, I can work my way up to varsity as I improve through college. Uh, yeah. We wanted to thank Chris Clark, certainly Rick Shinsky, and we wanted to thank uh, Paul Kayard and the guys out at Crescent for uh, talking to us a little bit about uh, the star. It's a boat that uh, you got to learn to love, but it was certainly an interesting one. Um, the other thing I want to mention, somebody sent me the background picture. Uh, this is the Sail GP uh, press conference that they had a couple of weeks ago. And you see the backs of our head, but I'm sitting somewhere back here. 
with uh, with a red baseball cap. So it was it was kind of a fun weekend. But that said, we uh, we wanted to thank all those guys for spending some time with us. The Bayview race will have a show on that a week from uh, today, and hopefully that'll be uh, with the winners and a little bit about Friday's uh, boat party in Port Huron. And everybody has a great time, and we look forward to having those conversations and bring you some stories that I don't think you're gonna you're gonna see in the regular in the regular news. So hopefully that'll be a, a fun show for us as well. So we'll be up in Port Huron on Friday, hopefully out on the media boat, take pictures of Saturday morning. And uh, just want to thank all the guys in the back. So we will be back with you guys in a week or so. So thanks for watching.